In his 2015 book, Divine Proportions, Norman J. Wildberger developed an alternative approach to trigonometry called rational trigonometry, which I think has a stronger explanatory power than the teaching of traditional trigonometry. One central question any trigonometry needs to answer is, what is the separation between lines that intersect? That is, how do we mathematically express how these lines are less separated than these lines? In traditional trigonometry, this separation is measured by an angle. Regardless of whether this angle is measured in degrees or radians, it is in some way proportional to the quotient of an arc length and its radius. This definition seems simple at first glance. However, measuring the length of a curve like that of an arc is a very difficult problem. In fact, it is only solvable using a formula from calculus. This means the relatively easy looking formula is really a mess underneath its surface. Because it's so messy, the problem how do we measure the distance between intersecting lines is generally skipped over in introductory books about trigonometry to avoid the interaction with calculus. This leaves a gap in students' understanding of the topic that will only be filled if they continue to take higher math courses. This should seem strange, though. The question, what is the separation between lines that intersect, has nothing immediate to do with circles. Because of this, rational trigonometry replaces the notion of the angle with a value called the spread. The spread is a value that is calculated from the equations of the two lines that are intersecting, and thus has no need to call upon calculus's aid to solve the most fundamental problem in its subject. Because lines written in standard form are so important to rational trigonometry, a concise notation is used where the line is defined as the ratio between its constants. Regardless of how it's notated, the spread is defined as this value. Here's an example of spread being calculated. Defining separation in this way solves another ambiguity of traditional trigonometry. While there are two potential angles between lines in traditional trigonometry, there is only one spread as it is defined in relationship to the equations of the intersecting lines. Armed with some notion of the separation between lines, trigonometry is used to solve triangles. By that I mean, given some information about the separation between lines forming the triangles and the lengths of the triangle sides, trigonometry sets out to solve the other values. In classical trigonometry, the trig functions are introduced to tackle this problem. In introductory books, these trig functions are defined in terms of ratios between the sides of a right triangle. However, this definition is perplexing as it's unclear how from this definition, you can solve an arbitrary input into these functions, say, sine of 72.3 degrees. Students are asked to put these numbers into a calculator, but it seems reasonable for one to ask, how did my calculator know the answer to this problem? Once again, the answer is calculus. The formal definition of these trig functions hidden beneath the calculator is a transcendental polynomial only understandable to those who have mastered Taylor series. Using these far from intuitive functions the and their relationships to a right triangle, four important identities can be proven. Pythagorean's theorem, the sum of interiors, the law of sines, and the law of cosines. In turn, solving triangles simply involves applying these appropriate identities given what you know. Rational trigonometry does not need to appeal to trigonometric functions as variations of these four identities can be proven with discoordinate geometry. They are called Pythagorean's theorem, the triple spread formula, spread law, and the cross law. Each of these identities directly replace an identity in traditional trigonometry. Anytime you would need to use the sum of interiors, you can instead use the triple spread formula. The same is true with the law of sines in the spread law, or the law of cosines in the cross law. As an example, I'll go over the first proof. However, if you want to further explore, check out Wildberger's YouTube channel or the burgeoning Wild Egg Wiki, both linked in the description of this video. In traditional trigonometry, we are told to think about Pythagorean's theorem in terms of distances. However, it's a bit simpler to look at this equation as a statement about distances squared, called quadrances. The definition of a distance involves a square root, which is eliminated when we think about quadrances instead. To start a proof like this, we define the points of the triangle and then use those definitions to write the equations of the lines forming the triangle and the quadrances of the triangle. As before, these lines can be written as ratios of their constants in standard form. In the case of Pythagorean's theorem, two of these lines are perpendicular, so we know that their slopes are reciprocal opposites by definition. Mathematically, that looks like this. Rearranging with algebra brings us to our desired conclusion. 
Now that we have these identities at our disposal, we can solve any triangle using rational trigonometry that could be solved using traditional trigonometry. Let's do an example. If we knew an angle and two side lengths, we could find the final side length by applying the law of cosines. Plugging everything in, we get our missing side. Remember, though our calculator makes it simple, cosine is an infinite series that is happening each time we do such a calculation. With the same information translated to the language of rational trigonometry, we can find the same answer. In fact, some information has been gained, as the irrational approach gives us the answer of each of the potential intersections of a 169 over 170 spread. For those more versed in mathematical jargon, it's interesting to note that the identities of rational trigonometry hold over any arbitrary field, save those of characteristic 2. For me, however, the main advantage of rational trig is that there's no need to appeal to calculus. Fundamentally, solving a triangle does not have to do with transcendental functions and lengths of curves, so it's strange that these identities are hidden in the mainstream explanation of how to solve triangles. Rational trigonometry allows students to see where each formula comes from each step of the way, with no need to reassure them that they will learn it later. Thank you to Professor Wildberger from the channel Insights into Mathematics for developing and systematizing the ideas of rational trig, and to Grant Sanderson from the channel 3 Blue 1 Brown for setting into motion the Summer of Mathematical Exposition, which this is an entry in. Also the Manum community, which developed the Python library used in creating the animations in this video.